Echidnas are a very unique species and they've got some health issues when it comes to their uh, diet that they get in a managed environment that was a problem for many, many years. So we were seeing gastritis, which is basically ulcers in the stomach on any animal that was fed on a zoo-based diet. And those diets were based on a carnivore requirement, sort of a, a meat pudding, shall we say. And that meat pudding uh, would have something like kangaroo or beef and wouldn't have any fiber. But when I started to investigate the echidna diet, I realized that they are a termite and ant eater, they're specialist insectivore, but when you're eating termites and ants with a sticky little tongue, you get a lot of other components to the diet as well, so they're probably getting a lot of wood fiber in there too. So adding wood fiber to the diet helped to reduce the incidence of gastritis in our zoo managed populations and seems to have improved the health of, of the animals that we have in our care. When investigating any diet, I start with the the natural diet of the animal. So I have a look at what that natural diet is. And with echidnas, it's their insectivores. So they eat termites and ants, they eat scarab larvae. They, there's a, a wide variety of insects that they actually eat in the wild. But I'm also a comparative animal physiologist. So even though we can see what an animal's natural diet is, we're never gonna see the whole picture. We're never gonna see what did they get from under that log or what did they eat from on top of that leaf. And so we look at how their digestive system compares to other species that we know more about. We know a lot about livestock, cows, pigs, chickens, and we know a lot about pets like dogs and cats and laboratory animals. So we use that information and we see what does their digestive system look like in comparison to the animals that we know more about. In order to investigate that, we had to see how different that diet was to their natural diet and what they were doing with it, how they were digesting it, how they were metabolizing those nutrients. And realized that these animals do have something different happening in their stomach. Their stomach was not going to be, it's not there for acid digestion of, of protein, for example, like ourselves. Those carnivore diets that we were basing the echidna diet on, it was causing some sort of disease. So we were seeing this gastritis in the stomach and the pathologist was looking at slides and saying, you know, this really looks like ruminal acidosis, something that we see in sheep or goats or uh, cows in their rumen when they eat something that's too high in sugar and not high enough in fiber. So that was something to, to go on. It gave us something to, to realize maybe we can make a change. And these diets often had, she's just looking to clean the bowl now, I think, these diets often had some sort of sugar component to it. it might have had added glucose, it might have had banana, because surprisingly enough, echidnas actually have a sweet tooth even though they don't have any teeth. So they are attracted to sweet things and that would help them to you know, find the diet palatable. Uh, when we removed those sweet things and added fiber, that's when we started to see an improvement in, in these animals' health. Interestingly, echidnas are uh, one of the monotremes uh, that we have in Australia, and some genomic studies done on those species found that they had uh, missing sequences of part of their genome that codes for stomach function as well as other gastric, uh, gastric components. And we don't know what the implications are of those missing sequences to their digestion and metabolism. We do know that they have a stomach that's unlike any other mammal. So they have a stomach that is alkaline, so it's not acidic like our stomachs are. It has no component of it that is, produces acid. And it has a really, really uh, diverse microbiome. Something that we would see sort of in the rumen of a cow. And that makes a lot of sense if we're, we're seeing a problem with that is kind of like a cow not getting any fiber. And when we add fiber, we stop seeing that health issue. So that's something that we tried, um, we implemented about 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago now. And since then we haven't seen any incidence of gastritis in our zoo managed population. We're currently getting a diet designed for us. So I gave the nutrient specifications to a manufacturer and they're making something that's a just add water mix. So it's kind of like making a, a cake mix really. So they just kind of add water to the consistency that the individual echidnas like. They really do seem to like it, which is very nice because it's, it's rare when an animal likes something that's good for them. So this seems to be doing be very good. They, they all seem to, to really like it. And if we do have animals that don't like the diet as much as um, they're not attracted to the diet or we have new animals that come through the hospital, we can add 
things that are not going to damage that alkaline gut. So we can, they seem to really like avocado. Avocado has a fatty acid composition that's sort of similar to termites, so it could be that that's what's attracting them. And we'll add something like that rather than um, anything sugary. It used to be that people would add papaya or pawpaw to attract echidnas, but now knowing that they have an alkaline gut and not, a, not an acidic gut, we, we are trying to uh, educate people to stay away from sugary things, even though they like it, and um, to also to, to use things that are gonna be less, uh, less damaging to that microbiome. Because it seems to be very easy to cause dys dysbiosis in echidnas. They also have these massive salivary glands, so they create a lot of saliva. And when we saw gastritis in zoo-managed echidnas, we'd also see a lot of drooling. So it looked like they were blowing bubbles in their food. And I think now, looking back, that that was them in an attempt to try and buffer their stomach acid that was, that was being over-generated and trying to protect their stomach lining from these, these ulcers that, we, that we'd been seeing. So now we don't see that I won't see that excess saliva, except sometimes they blow bubbles when they're just anticipating food. And again, it's kind of like us, you know, waiting for food. You kind of get those gastric juices going. And with echidnas, they might blow a bubble here and there when they're trying to um, get ready to, to eat their food or, or thinking about their diet that's coming up. We were, in, with the previous diet, also seeing some sloppier feces, and we grade that on a, a scale from one to five. So one is a very, dry, chalky feces, and five is like liquid diarrhea, pourable, basically, feces. Uh, so we had the keepers collect those feces, and then we also uh, did some microbiome studies, so we could see if the, um, if the diet changes were having an effect on their microbiome. And interestingly enough, there was a study done at University of Adelaide with a, it was a citizen science project called CSI, uh, Echidna CSI. And people from all over the country would ship feces, echidna feces, into Adelaide, and they would analyze it to see what dietary components there are. And it really gave us a, a, di a different understanding of echidna diet. So we found that they, uh, they eat a very wide variety of insects, not just the two or three different types of insects that we'd thought of before. And that really, it not only showed us that they ate a diversity of insects, but there was also plant material in, the, in that feces. So they did DNA analysis of the feces and found that there was a wide variety of plants, which meant that they, we were correct in assuming that fiber is probably a much bigger component of their diet than we ever expected. There's always something new to look at. And for me, my favorite animal is always the animal that I'm working at at that moment. <laughs> so, so my favorite animal has been echidnas for quite a long time. But we are looking at all of the different implications to those genomic differences that we're seeing. What does that mean for their glucose metabolism? You know, we've done some studies now to be able to measure their glucose, so that's soon to come, hopefully. And we've also looked at what other components of their stomach uh, and their digestion are affected by those gene sequences missing or those alterations in genes. And can we better feed them based on what their, their natural diet would be? But as we realized that this was something that we wanted to be very consistent and be consistent in texture as well, because echidnas in the past had also had some problems with impaction from meat, the sinew of meat. So we wanted to avoid that. And that's when we brought a manufacturer on board to make the diet for us to the nutrient specifications that was gonna be a nice, consistent texture and uh, something that we could make thicker or thinner depending on the individual echidna's preference. Uh, it was also something that would keep very well on the shelf and be able to be shipped overseas for echidnas that are being held around the world. So this is a diet that's being used not just at Taronga, but uh, there are zoos internationally that are using this diet for echidnas now, and it's been quite successful.